now uh, and Panin from Malaysia Design Archive and the Visual Program at the Cultural Center University of Malaya, uh, who are the co-organizers of today's evening talk. Uh, very happy to have um, Kajin here with us. Kajin has also been helping the archive <laughs> collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been helping us with collecting sort of like materials over the elections period as well. You know, uh, so a lot of the propaganda posters, the sort of like election leaflets, and uh, and all the various other sort of like paraphernalia has been very generously donated by Kajin on behalf of PRA, um, which is. What? Uh, which you used to work for, yes. and how would you describe KRA? Uh, uh, it's a public affairs consulting firm okay. specializing on intra ASEAN relations. Okay, I would call it a corporate intelligence agency, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's more accurate. Uh, uh, about it. <laughs> so, either way, uh, Kajin is currently a freelancer, yes. but he has graduated from the university with a degree in history and something else. No, just history. Just history, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so pure historian. And uh, this is actually based on the thesis that you worked on, your senior thesis, right? That you worked on at Yale. Um, and uh, besides that, you're doing freelancing at the moment. Uh, and you also have another set of interests, which is to look at the afterlife of sort of like video games, memes, and sort of like virtual reality and how it interfaces with the political landscape. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to sort of like move it to you to sort of explain how. You're bridging this historical thing with your sort of like even your current interest in all these other sort of like new kinds of technology. Over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, so I will start. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kajin or KJ, as most people call me. Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll start and then uh, we'll, I'll sort of like go through what I'm trying to achieve here today in a little bit. Um, does anyone recognize this uh, photograph by any chance? Saint John? Uh, mm. John? No, no. no uh, it's ah yes. So this is one of the wells of. Uh, there are seven wells originally. Only four remain at the foot of Bukit China. So Bukit China is in Malacca. It's the largest and oldest Chinese cemetery uh, outside of China. The, it's two hundred and fifty thousand square meters in area, and there are twelve thousand graves, including some that date back to the Ming Dynasty. So it's a huge, huge complex, and actually Bukit China it consists of actually three hills that come together to form this um, cemetery complex. Uh, but anyway, going back to this well, this, there used to be a well here, it was demolished, and my father is from Malacca, uh, from uh, Tanjung Kaling, if anyone knows where that is. Um, but he, he used to do, so like when I grew up and every time I would pass by here, he would tell me, Oh, look son, see, they demolished this well, terrible <laughs> love. This used to be Hang Li Po well, the Chinese princess who came here. She was like the first Chinese person to come here from like a very important historically. <laughs> then what do they do? They demolish it. And now they name it Parigi Raja instead. <laughs> terrible. And then so basically he was equating it to an erasure of Chinese ethnic memory. Um, the truth is a little bit more complicated than that, um, but in, and in actual fact, um, it's not from the most historical records that we can find, it's not Parigi Han Lipo, it's actually Parigi Raja. Uh, this one is recorded in sort of like the journals of Manuel Heredia, one of the sort of European explorers who came and ooh, recorded uh, <laughs> uh, and what? Well, you're so and he records this as Burigi Raja uh, in the 16th century. Um, and there is no archaeological evidence <laughs> indicating that this well is in any way at all related to Hamlet Po. Um, so the question is, why, why does this name persists, where does this myth persist, persist? Um, and this comes comes to where, uh, this comes to my sort of area of study and why I'm interested in social media, memes, fake news and why I was co collecting propaganda leaflets all over the place because 
and in, 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 in university as well, my study was not so much the study of history, as in history with a capital H, 1601, this thing happened, this blah blah, that's not really my area of study. I'm less concerned with what happened, and more concerned with how people remember what happened. So, um, and the sort of area that I focused in in university was genocide studies. Uh, and you know, in genocide, in any sort of like ethnic conflict, trauma, you know, you go from Tiananmen to the Pol Pot regime, how we remember the past, or how we don't remember the past, has many political consequences. So, you know, we call it myth, we call it urban legend, some people will say kopi tiam kok kok, so to say, right? So, and, and now the latest term we use is fake news. Uh, and of course, when it comes to Malacca, the sort of biggest kopi tiam kok kok conspiracy theory is this guy. <laughs> so, not to disappoint Alan, who was angling for this. So, and, and I'll, I'll come back to this later, um, because I think it's important that we don't. I think it's important that we move beyond a simple dismissal. I, it's a stupid conspiracy theory to sort of considering why the myths persist, where do they originate from, who are the people who are propagating these myths, and what kind of political agendas, if any, um, do they are they trying to push? Um, but to this, this sort of like this is sort of like you could say the sort of like conspiracy theory logic of why Hang Tua is actually Chinese. Uh, Hang Ipo, oh, Hang Tua, Hang Hang, must be related. So therefore, Hang Ipo came uh, with Zheng He or whatever, and, uh, and he brought, she brought along retainers and warriors and bodyguards and must have been one of the Hang, the Hang Tua was one of them. And actually, if you think about Hokkien, Hang Tua, so I think he was the eldest of five brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, then they think, no, actually Han, uh, you see, no, uh, it's actually Han. So like, 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 as in the, the like Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so it has like sort of like ethnic Chinese sort of like implications as well. But you know, this is the whole conspiracy theory. We will come back to this later. But the story that we want to focus on today is really the story of this particular place in, in Malacca called Bukit China, which I mentioned to you, is the oldest and largest semi-colliery complex outside of China. Uh, this is a very old picture from the 1920s of the British archives. So this is... Ooh, how do I use these pointers? In Never mind. <laughs> uh, so, so you have this whole thing here. This is the Bukit China. This is the entire hill. And so you can see actually there are two hills in Malacca, essentially. I mean two major hills. One is Bukit China. The other one is... Does anyone know? Yes, St. Paul's Hill, right. Um, where obviously the church is, um, St. Francis, the statue, and every St. Francis Xavier statue is there, and is regarded, and the set house is at its foot. So, St. Paul's Hill, you know, church, statue of St. Francis Xavier, at its foot is the set house, very much a sort of a colonial narrative and colonial layering of history in place. In contrast, people would say that Bukit China is perhaps the counterpoint to that. Not just in terms of being one of the other two hills, I mean the other hill, but also in terms of its history. So this is the view of that we have, if you look from the top of Bukit China down, you can see that Malacca is a very, very, very flat place. And it was, I mean, it was chosen for this reason. Um, but I think it's important to situate what else is in the vicinity of Bukit China, same as why it's important to know that the stat house is at the foot of St. Paul's Hill. So this is the um, so like World War II um, war memorial for specifically dedicated to Chinese people who suffered and were killed during the Japanese occupation. Uh, you can see the symbology is part you know, Emperor of China and part, uh, obviously, Republican China. Um, but I think it's important to note that, you know, this is a Chinese business community project around the area. Uh, this one is interesting. This one is a uh, drawing by C.F. Uh, C. Reimer, uh, another European sort of uh, colonialist, architect, soldier, sort of like a man of many talents. One of his talents was designing military structures. 
So this is the plan for a barracks at the at the a history of World War II, so like Japanese occupation, a history of colonialism. Uh, and I think the last thing to note, aside from you know obvious what is obvious, the main dynasty graves and the graves that have always been there, are these little things. This is at the entrance, the so you know, the walk up past this to get to Bukit China to the cemetery. Uh, this uh, you know, this is the supposedly a uh, Portuguese man of war. You've seen it in Malacca, completely fake. Uh, <laughs> very, uh, you know, I, you know, you should just go because it's interesting to walk around. Uh, and that over there is obviously um, a famosa. Uh, so I'm not sure if you can see the distance over the there. Yeah, no, actually, it is in the grave. So you have the Portuguese man of war. Um, and you have that. The grave is right there, but this is actually a Formosa. Mm -hmm. And you have here. You mean like a replica? Yes, you have a mini set house <laughs> as well. Um, so it's interesting because these are sort of like leftover plans from uh, effort to make Bukit China into a sort of like a uh, tourist attract, uh, tourist attraction, and have like China, you know, Chinese tourists or European tourists sort of walk through Bukit China instead of just seeing graves, they would see all these replicas. Mm -hmm. But I think symbolically, what 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 it can indicate, this might be a bit of a literary reading of this, is that um, Bukit China in many ways encapsulates a lot of the layers of history of Malacca, and in one point of time, they even attempted to miniaturize Malacca history and place it into a theme park that is Bukit China. So I think that has interesting implications for the symbolological potency of Bukit China as a site of memory. Um, last thing to go, and this is important as we move forward. Uh, these two, I, I don't know if everybody can read Chinese, but they sound the same, Pan Pao San and Pan Pao Fan. Uh, but um, one refers to San Pao Tong, which is uh, the alternative sort of moniker for Admiral Zheng He, the Ming Dynasty eunuch admiral who came to Malacca and established diplomatic relations, or you know, depending on different versions of the story, he was either a peaceful trader or a sort of like symbol of Chinese imperialism. But it's important to note that this is the historically wrong version, in fact, the caretakers of Bukit China have repeatedly corrected people saying, no, 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 it's got nothing to do with Cheng Ho, it's this actually, which means three treasures, mountain or hill. But it's important to remember that this keeps coming back. So now I'm just going to go through a little bit about why, now that I've established on why Bukit China is such a symbolical potent place, uh, this is also important to note that there's been a history of like back and forth between authorities, even in colonial times, into the present day over what to do about Bukit China. Because if you go back to the map of Malacca, if you want to get from this part of Malacca to that part of Malacca, you have to go around the stupid hill. I mean, not the stupid hill. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you know, I imagine an uncle driving around saying like, hey, why do you have to drive around this hill? Uh? And it's a one-way street. Yeah, and I, I mean, the Malacca is all one-way street, you know, I mean, it didn't used to be that way, but, you know, it's all one-way street now, so it's quite ma fun uh, to, to get to the other side. So, obviously, if you're a developer, you think, ah, I'm a genius, I'm just going to cut through the, the hill and build a road. It's a simple solution. And, obviously, the, the, is, the British also thought about this, but in, uh, let's just start with this. 1683, the Capitan. So, the Capitan of Malacca would have been a Chinese comedian leader who worked and so like the business community leader, but also sort of like as the Taikor of the Chinese community um, and importantly would have collaborated and cooperated with the colonial government in terms of facilitating trade etc. Um, but they bought, this capitan bought 106 acres from the Dutch colonial government for burial grounds even though before that certain parts of Bukit China had already been used for some grades. Then they built a temple at the foot of the hill called San Po Ting. My Hokkien is bad. Uh, but in Chinese, it's San Pao Ching. 
right? So the same the same confusion happens, right? Whether it's the San Pao Gong of the Chinese Yunnan or the San Pao as in three treasures. Same confusion happens here, but they have Tua Pek Gong, a sort of uh, uh, a local deity, uh, yeah, local deity as their main deity. In the 1840s, the British planned a road construction. They planned to acquire the hill, build a road through it, and this effort is opposed by the Capitan. In the 1860s, it happens again, but this time, the, most of the opposition comes from the Cheng Hun Teng Temple Committee. So, okay. Cheng Hun Teng is the oldest Chinese temple outside of China. Uh, well, it's disputed, but. That's, uh, <laughs> but, but you know that, that's one of the claims. Um, uh, but what is important is that temple committees. Uh, you can think of temple committees. Uh, the, the whoever the chair is is usually the community leader. So by now, by here, you can see a social change in Malaysia as well. Um, the business community leader isn't necessarily just the kapitan, but it's also the temple community, the chairman of the temple committee at the time. Uh, and you see this sort of like structure, it's like being, uh, uh, the analogy I have is like if you're the chairman of Royal Slango Club or Royal Lake Club, it's like a big deal, you're like, you know, uh, you'll be Hatler or whatever. Um, and this, you know, this was the post by the Cheng Kun Teng um, Temple Committee. And in 1920, again, there's a de uh, plan development and this is also a post. But really, the one we want to focus on um, is 1984. Uh, and here is when I will put a disclaimer, which is that you know this is a work in progress, mainly based on archival material. I haven't had the opportunity to talk to that many of the activists and sort of like um, people who are personally involved. That that is a further goal of my research that I want to expand to. Um, so if you do happen to know anybody of these people, I would be very very happy if you <laughs> could, could put me in touch. But 1984. So there was a plan to develop Bukit China by the Malacca state government. And uh, as you can see, you can't really see that clearly, but there's, it's going, it's basically the entire hill is going to be developed and built into this huge complex. And here are some of the buzzwords that were being used. It's going to be the, uh, the premier development of Malacca. It's going to be the largest cultural heritage complex in all of Asia. It's going to be a huge tourist attraction. Um, so, of course, um, I think what's important here to note is Bukit China, as a, uh, they saw Bukit China as a potential development. It's on prime land. You know, hills are super popular for atas developments like Kenny Hills. Um, and, you know, book, uh, a lot of developers looked at Bukit China as one of them. This was well, the Malacca State Government was involved, but more importantly, there was also a private Chinese company with deep MCA links heading this project. <laughs> um, and that's important for the story later on. Uh, but what kind of development was it? Right? I think uh, more important to just sort of like scoff at cultural heritage is to sort of know what kind of cultural heritage, what did the Malacca State Government see as the kind of cultural heritage that they wanted to promote. Uh, so one, of, so there was a lot of buildings, but some of them were a kampong style hotel, whatever that means. Because um, I, I guess you slap on a few kampong style roofs and put some hot tubs and suddenly it's kampong style hotel. Never mind that ten story tall. <laughs> um, a mosque uh, and a basic and dance center, a joget specifically. Um, uh, obviously, the optics don't look good because you're building Kampung Star Hotel, mosque, party center, literally on top of dead Chinese people. <laughs> uh, to put it bluntly, right? Uh, and obviously, the optics of this did not go down very well with the local Malacca Chinese community. Um, and at first, the kind of rhetoric that the, the sort of like local temple community resorted to was very moderate, right? Uh, and not, not historical in the sense that we, in the, in the same way we think of Bukit China today. The kind of things that they were putting out in press statements, in talking to people, was really about the graves. So, you know, we need to be sensitive, we need to display sensitivity to the families, we need to respect the graves, we need to, to make sure that, you know, that Chinese families can visit their graves during... It didn't gain much traction. Um, 
and you know they were seen as a sort of like the, the narrative at this point was seen as one of development versus preservation and in most cases and especially in this era uh, and especially in Malacca where um, in general the civil society movement is nowhere as vibrant and so strong as it is in say for example Penang um, you know you don't have the same levels of you know uh, Activists living in Tanjung Bunga, being angry about the environment and all that. Nowhere near the same levels in Malacca. Um, so there was not much traction in the local community. Obviously, Chinese business leaders did it. But it then somehow became a national issue when a certain MP who was at the time representing Banda Malacca took it up. <laughs> so this is actually part of the story of. Lin Kitiang's rise to prominence as well in the 1980s. Um, so Lin Kitiang basically takes up this issue uh, and very quickly um, he, talk, he changes the Malacca issue from an issue of sensitivity in terms of respect to an issue of rights. So depriving people, whether the chief minister is depriving people of their rights. And it's not explicitly stated, but obviously he means Chinese people of their rights. Um, and I think, uh, and, and you know, this was being painted as, uh, uh, so this is one of the caricatures in 94. So you can see already that something has already started to happen, which is that the temple keeps saying that you shouldn't use this character because this is the one that refers to <laughs> But in the Chinese sort of like media and a lot in a lot of of caricatures and popular depictions, they're already using the Tenghe version of the, the name of the hill. And so you can see the different players. Uh, Liang is there, Lim is there, Tan is there. So these these fellas are MCA fellas and then uh Li Tiang is over there. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a very entertaining. <laughs> this is a very entertaining um, depiction. Partly because so you have Cheng, This is Cheng Kun Teng over here. Um, so you can see this making book in China being elevated to the national platform, being picked up by the Chinese newspapers, and being depicted as a sort of at this point still a sort of like Chinese. It's not. A, it's still a Chinese kind of like Chinese developer versus Lim Kitian, DAP versus MCA. But as the kind of narrative goes out of their control, activists resort to two main narratives. And you can see this very clearly in the difference between Chinese newspaper coverage and what um, the Chinese paper news uh, uh, pick up on, and English media and Malay media coverage. So this is what this is some. These are like some of the sort of like big narrative strokes that um, the sort of like English media would pick up on which is that you know Hang Li Po and the Sejara of Nayu and the sort of the popular legend you know married Sultan Mansur Shah um, you know the Capitans were essential to the development of Malacca as a great trading empire blah 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 and also that you know the fact that Tsung came to Malacca was a sign of no, I, sometimes I wouldn't go as far as to say tribute, but certainly a recognition of Malacca's greatness as a trading empire. So you can sort of see the the broad strokes that are aligning themselves, and this is the kind of this is the kind of content that it would uh, this is like targeted marketing already. Um, this is the kind of content that would appear mostly in the Chinese media. You know, Hang Li Po as a, sort of like the origin, the Adam Eve kind of like origin story of. Chinese people in Mal not just Malacca but Malaysia, um, capitans as Confucian court officials, right? So they would sort of like say, oh, what is the role of a capitan? Why were they important in the development of Bukit China? And sort of say, oh, you know, they were the 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 the, the, the Chinese newspapers would call them Fa Gong, right? And sort of like did contrast have them in so sort of, uh, Qing Dynasty with the pigtail <laughs> portraits. And sort of like depict them as Confucian court officials and really sort of like arbiters of not just Chinese culture but Chinese ethics. Um, and also emphasizing the legacy of Admiral Cheng Po or Zheng He 
and the Ming Dynasty, right? Uh, at the time, after uh, Yongle. So you know you have these tools sort of like targeted marketing, um, but really the one that really picks up is this one, the sort of like Chinese centric one. But I think what is important to note is that if these two narratives, there's a concession, right? There's a concession that in order to survive and in order to get people to care about Bukit China, whether it's the sort of like more Malacca Sultanate centric um, narrative or the Ming Dynasty centric narrative, both these narratives rely on uh, saying Bukit China is important because of its relation to a greater power, whether that's Ming Dynasty or the Malacca Sultanate. It's not important in of itself. Uh, it is relation and proximity to these things that make it important. And I think that's a, that's a key concession that activists had to make. Uh, and I'm not putting a judgment on activists for, for, for doing this. I think it makes strategic sense as an activist to sort of like frame it in a bigger picture like this. But this obviously has consequences down the line. Uh, so very quickly, MCA changes tracks and like, Oh, you know, like by 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 sort of like the 1985, the issue had become or oh, be China is a Chinese rights issue, and obviously MCA had to defend Chinese people. So <laughs> then MCA starts raising funds to for for the, the Facebook China campaign, which is like oh, like I've never seen MCA and this time be so pally. Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe that's the absolute, but. Um, but anyway, so there's this thing, but I think what is also important is to notice, and it's very easy to miss this loop and fan, fan to fan. Loop and fan are actually names, they're not the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to... Um, but basically you see, uh, it's very hard to see, but it says here, um, Luke, Mr. Luke Ting Yu, Vice President of the National Association of Chinese School Teachers. And so, basically, what has happened here is that it's expanded from a Malacca issue, from a Malacca Chinese issue, to not just a Chinese issue, but a Chinese vernacular education issue. Right? So, and of course, these events are not happening in isolation. I think we have to remember the context of, of the mid 1980s. All these things are happening, right? You know, Matthew comes in in 1981. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, NEP is, is, has already been happening, but you know, obviously, it expands it in several different ways. And at the same time, this is when uh, the Dong Xiao Dong, um, the Association of Chinese Schools, and they sort of regulate and um, they, are, they, they, how do you, um, they they are sort of like the regulator and sort of like um, community group that oversees Chinese schools. Uh, they are really making big strides in this era, right? So they, uh, at the same time, you, you see a rise in the popularity of Chinese vernacular education. Uh, and I think that if we draw a sort of parallel cultural development, uh, I think you can see a parallel here, right? Um, I thought, because if you think about it, what is it? If you have to think about Malaysian Chinese identity and what it means to be Malaysian Chinese, um, and in the 1980s, uh, I argue that there was a reconfiguration of what it meant to be Malaysian Chinese. So people like my parents and older, uh, many of them would never have spoken Mandarin, many of them were not Chinese literate, and they certainly would not have used simplified Chinese. Um, but in the sort of like Chinese vernacular education movement, there's a sort of like movement to increase usage of Mandarin, increase Chinese literacy, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, I don't think that these two cultural mov movements happening at the same time, one of Bukit China's realignment as a, not just a Malacca Chinese, but a greater China kind of movement, and the sort of like reconfiguration of Chinese language are unrelated. Um, so and then, and actually it is very interesting because you see in the in the, by by the tail end of the Save Bukit China campaign, you know it became huge. So marathon, Lim Kee Siang would go to markets and collect money for in a donation box, um, and they managed to get the 
sort of like Chinese diaspora across Asia to contribute press statements or contribute money. So, uh, you know, Chinese businessmen and Chinese communities um, in not just uh, across Malaysia but in Singapore, Thailand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all c contributed and all sort of lent their voices and signed a joint declaration in terms of why Bukit China has to be saved. Um, in the, uh, sort of like local media, if you're from you're from Taiwan, the reason you're going to pitch to your readers why you should care about this random place in Malaysia is because of the relation to your own country's history. Um, so you see the sort of like transformation of the narrative into this Chinese centric, uh, China centric one. Uh, and and you know and here is one of the, those examples of the temple committee saying again like no 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 no, Chen He, nothing to do with us. It's Tam Pao San, as in three treasures, not Zheng He. And they make this correction, uh, and they, they invite people to contribute like historical information to prove, you know, like there's no relation, real relationship with Zheng He. Uh, but the myth still persists, and obviously it, it never really goes away. So you go from Tam Pao San to Tam Pao San to Tam Pao San. Um, it's a bit of a circular movement. And here's the thing, in 1984, after the whole controversy and the whole arguing back and forth between the state government and activists, and finally the state government said, okay, we're not going to develop the place, they actually changed the name, the, ch the name was changed from Parigi Hanglipo to Parigi Raja, and after 1984, they changed it back to Parigi Hanglipo. At the same time, Jalan Bukit China, then was changed in also in 1984 after the whole mess to Jalan Hanglipo. Right? So you could see this as basically the historians were like, ah, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, that's one way you see it. Or you could see it as the Malacca State government recognizing the power of a myth, the power of a narrative that galvanized an entire um, Chinese diaspora and Chinese activist community to move. On this, and I think the most, the one of the, you can see this kind of concession, this kind of like, yeah, okay, and even the temple committee start to give up and basically just like, okay lah, we are related to Sun He, whatever, <laughs> uh, because you can see this. So I told you in 795 they established Tong Pek Kong as the main deity, but in the 1960s, San Ho Kong, as in the sort of like deity, deity version of Cheng Ho, <laughs> is introduced into the temple. And this statue, for some reason or another, is constantly stolen. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that's quite common with many sort of like uh, statues that are regarded as valuable. Um, they decide, ah, we give up, we go back to Papekong. <laughs> <laughs> but in 1995, the Malacca Chinese Chamber of Commerce proposed, why don't we have a statue of Cheng Ho in the temple compound? And then the temple committee says, yeah, sure, why not, if you're paying for it. <laughs> but I think here there's a key concession that despite all its talk of saying no 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 Cheng, Cheng Ho had nothing to do with this, finally they relent and sort of like realize that for tourists, for activists, and for many people, it's actually more beneficial for the temple to to just sort of like let it be like yeah yeah we we are very important because we are related to Cheng So I think that's a key concession. And, and by the night, and by 1990, it's already a done deal, because the Chinese Premier Li Peng visits um, Ho Sang Teng, um, uh, uh, and and what his comments are basically like, oh, you know, Bukit China stands here as a monument to China Malaysia China Southeast Asia relations with Cheng Ho. Um, and I think it's also interesting because um, um, today, because of today, right? Because you have a huge Chinese project in Malacca called Malacca Gateway. Um, it's, uh, you know, Johor has Forest City, Malacca has Malacca Gateway. Um, and I think, in, and you know, this is a huge mainland Chinese project that uh, some people say might fail, but there's basically three artificial islands that 
that they want to build as a sort of like harbor in Malacca. And I think the most interesting part of these fellas are this motto, the past presents the future. Mm. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this, this again is appealing to that sense of the narrative that they constructed and most people have accepted about Malacca and its relationship with China and why it's so important for Tsung He and, the, and why it's politically important for China to establish that Chinese relations in Southeast Asia, throughout Asia, under Tsung He was in fact a peaceful diplomatic mission of trade and not of antagonistic imperialism. Although there's some um, historical evidence to suggest otherwise. I think something else to note about Malacca Gateway is the Chinese name of Malacca Gateway. Does anyone know what the Chinese name of Malacca Gateway is? It's Huang Jing Gang, as in Huang Di, the Huang. So Huang Di means emperor. Jing is capital, so like Beijing, northern capital. So, and Kang means um, harbor. So, the Chinese characters, if you take it literally, means the emperor's capital's harbor. And I think that the, so like Malacca Gateway is such a, <laughs> such a like, oh, this gateway. To <laughs> <laughs> like, the future, what kind of future? Then I think the, 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 the Chinese kind of characters may belie a more sort of uh, ambitious intent. Um, but, so today, they change it back. <laughs> uh, and it's also Jalan Bukit China now again. So, you know, with this sort of like cyclical nature, you know, the, the, it's like a meme, a meme that keeps coming back. That's why, you know, I study like viruses and memes and all, because they keep coming back and like a bad WhatsApp chain, a chain message, they just never go away. Um, but, they, and, but these things are really sustained by uncles in coffee jams, right? <laughs> um, How do you and, spread the WhatsApp messages? Ah, great. <laughs> no, I'm going to copy some blood. <laughs> uh, but now it's Burgi Raja. And, and so, like, my question is when will it change back to Burgi Hang Lipo? And if you think about the sort of like state, the, the stakes at play, of the political stakes at play, the sort of like symbolological stakes at play, you could argue that may, there is a sort of incentive for certain parties to change it back to Burgi Hang Lipo. Um, so this is um, uh, so this is very recently in London, right? In London, uh, you know, it's been super hot in London, abnormally hot. And what's interesting is that it's been so hot that in the ground, the outlines of mansions and old buildings that have been demolished are appearing. <coughs> So the heat is so incredible that the past is the past the imprint of these mansions that have been demolished is coming back. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 you know you know the, the heat causes things to come back, uh, things of the past, and so you know we we may come full circle and the ghosts of the past keep appearing time and time again um, in myth, in legend, but with full political consequences that can change our um, landscape. So that's it. Thank you.